So we need some sort of daily detoxification plan is what I call it, right? So we need to be doing something on a regular basis to clean it through. It's not about living a very toxic, you know, life most of the year and then doing a detox and cleaning up shop. This is the Anthropology Podcast, the podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As an anthropologist and naturopathic doctor, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Before we jump into the interview, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook community, Legacy. If you want to be something amazing, you need to surround yourself with amazing people. The legacy community is made up of badass women living, not leaving, but living our legacy every single day. We are leaders, parents, entrepreneurs, and innovators collectively committed to leaving the world better than we found it. My mission is to support the health and optimization of these badass superheroes, literally to places we never thought imaginable. If you are on a mission and get it that your health is the key to your unlimited potential, then join us. We are super awesome. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash DE legacy. See you there. Have you ever felt like you just need a detox that maybe you should stop eating for three days or down a boatload of charcoal something? I know you feel this way because you come into my office and you ask for it. You ask for these opportunities to clean up your system. I wanted to bring someone in to talk about detox, someone who understands the process, the exposure, and deals with this on a daily basis in their clinical practice. And I had the pleasure today to sit down with Josh Gitalis. Josh is a holistic nutritionist. He has a background as a, as a trainer, and he's a developed a series of online programs designed to help you identify exposures in your everyday life. This was a fantastic interview because we blended practical things that you could start to implement on a daily basis with a balance towards understanding your exposures and some of the strategic detoxification moves that you can take part in several times per year. If you are a human and you engage on the planet and you are looking at cleaning up your life, this episode will clarify things for you across the board. Josh Gitalis. Josh Gitalis, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm really excited to delve into a conversation with you. We've had numerous opportunities over the last year to to start to chat about some of these topics, and I'm always fascinated uh, by your perspective. You're a functional medicine practitioner, holistic nutritionist, teacher, and now a new dad. Tell us a little bit about how you got to this point in your journey. Right. So um, in terms of being a new dad, I think that's a lesson maybe for another day. (laughs) I know. As I (laughs) I asked her, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but for some of the other things, um, you know, I've always been interested in health. I, 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 you know, I remember my first biology class many years ago and just, you know, looking at the inside of a cell and the organelles and just being astounded by what's in our body and how it all functions. Um, and after high school, I, I went to go study kinesiology. I did a four-year degree. In my last year, I worked on the football team as an athletic trainer. We saw a lot of acute issues, you know, a lot of injuries. Um, And that was quite fun. I haven't seen a lot of that since then. But afterwards, there wasn't really an area of interest that I wanted to go into that was a natural flow from kinesiology. Like I always had so many different interests. I enjoyed the mind. I enjoyed the body. A lot of my electives were in psychology. Um, But nothing really sort of encapsulated all of my interests. But I knew something was out there. Anyway, after university, I took some time off, went to go play in the mountains. I'm a, I'm a diehard skier, so I did some skiing, I did some rock climbing, mountain biking, and just had some fun. And then after about a year, I needed some more mental stimulation and came home, worked as a health coach for a bit, you know, became a personal trainer and did that for a while. And I realized that you know, people who were into fitness were more into working out rather than working in and doing the things that were necessary for true health. Um, you know, I had, I, I remember one client I had who, um, would come into the gym and she would smell like smoke every workout. 
And, you know, we had the conversation about smoking and she said, you know, that's something I'll continue to do and I'll just, you know, do my physical activity too. And that just like ate me up inside. So I think I got little messages here and there. Um, so I ended up going to see um, someone speak at a, at a, at um, a personal training conference and he spoke about holistic nutrition, uh, nutrition from the dirt up. And it was the first time I'd come across this. I'd, I'd done sort of traditional nutrition in university. Um, but this type of nutrition was so new to me and I knew I had to do it. I was just blown away. Uh, shortly thereafter, I enrolled in nutrition school, got my diploma. And then uh, right out of school, I began my practice and I haven't looked back. We all have seasons that we move through in uh, in our practice. And, and one of the, the seasons that I, I watched you move through in the last year was really starting to talk about exposure and detoxification and, and what a like, great segue from this concept of working from the inside out um, as opposed to this notion of just working out. I love the congruence with that. Um, can we get into and talk a little bit about that, about the concept of exposure and and delve into the notion of detoxification a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, one of the reasons do you want me to just go on this? I want you, you to. A, I want you to. I want okay. you to just go on this. <laughs> I have so much to say, so that's not a problem at all. Kind of knew that. But, <laughs> so, I mean, when I work with my clients in our clinic, um, I'm all about looking for those slivers, is what I call them, and that's how I explain it to my clients. Where, you know, if you you, you know you get a sliver in your foot, you know, there's a few options. You can put a band aid on it. You can take Tylenol to numb the pain. Um, but, and that might help a little, but you're not really getting to the root cause. And that sliver wound isn't going to heal until you take that sliver out. So I'm always looking for those slivers in my clinical practice. Like what are those things that are stopping this person from healing? We all know if we get cut, the body wants to heal. So toxins, um, is a huge sliver and toxicants. They are these kind of wild cards. I call them sometimes, where it's somewhat impossible to know what each person's body burden is, meaning how many toxins they're exposed to on a regular basis and how many toxins might be in their body at any one given time. Um, But we can assume that everyone is being exposed at some level. You know, we've we've introduced 80,000 chemicals into the environment in the past 100 years, and very few of them have ever been tested for safety. So I always look at this as a possible root cause of my client's issues. Detoxification at some level is always part of a protocol, whether it's just, you know, some simple recommendations or a more comprehensive approach to that. And, um, you know, so it's, it's part of every client's picture. And that's why I've gone to explore it in such uh, an in-depth uh, way. And did, did the journey in terms of about to be become apparent? Was that part of what made this bubble up to the surface? Or was it just this perfect confluence of where you're at in life and the, ex- and the things you were seeing in practice? Um, it was already, already in the forefront of my mind. I mean, for personal health, uh, my wife, Megan, and I take part in detoxification activities on a regular basis because we know the impact of toxins. We can talk more about that in a moment. But of course, when, <laughs> yeah, when we um, decide to conceive and we're expecting our child and preparing the room and, you know, making all these decisions as to how to, you know, lay out his environment. Um, So many things came up that we maybe didn't consider even before. And we were in tune to a lot of this stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, thinking about his mattress, thinking about the furniture in his room, thinking about the clothes that he was wearing, um, the wipes that we were using, the diapers. I mean, it just, it it goes so deep. And we also recognize that um, the younger you are, like, you know, infants, babies, children, if they're exposed to the same toxin as we are exposed to as an adult, the impact is many times greater on them. They have smaller livers, their skin is more absorbent, and they're just more vulnerable to a lot of those insults. Right. And it's only natural that if you are a functional medicine practitioner and you're used to hanging out in that clinical space where you're going upstream, you're addressing the root cause of the problem, 
when we go upstream, ultimately, there's two things that are triggering this dysregulation. It's it's exposure, usually environmental or or an infection. So, um, you know, no matter where we're at in a journey as a clinician, it's only a matter of time before this becomes a, a primary focus of, of what we're doing clinically. You know, in some of the ways that we work with, with patients in terms of being able to manage a toxic burden or exposure history, certainly if we know what they've been exposed to, we, we can dial in from a specific space. Um, but for a lot of patients, they come in, they're like, I th- I'm pretty sure I need to do a detox. Can you just define what a detox is? And then we're going to get into whether or not this is something that everyone should be doing. Absolutely. So first of all, before we define detox, it's important to understand that Everyone is detoxing all the time, right? So it's a natural process of the body. Um, We don't have to do anything in order for that process to happen. And if it wasn't happening, we'd all be dead right now. So there's these processes in the body that transform things that could be harmful if they increase to higher levels into things that are non-harmful and then help get them out of the body. So when we're doing detoxification protocols with clients, we're harnessing the processes that already exist in the body to help move that stuff out of the body. And we're always considering, you know, what's, what do we have to remove and what do we have to include? So removal, obviously, is making sure that your environment is as clean as possible. We can get into that if you want. Um, and then helping with the removal is opening the channels of elimination is supporting liver detoxification, providing the right nutrients, um, and helping the body get rid of that. I, I use w- with detoxification. I help. I, I use the analogy of a dishwasher in a restaurant. You know, if, if you consider the restaurant sort of your whole body, and the dishwasher is your detoxification pathways. There's dirty dishes coming in, and then they're cleaned by the dishwasher, and then they come out clean on the other side. And a couple things can happen. Those dishes can pile up too quickly, or that dishwasher can't keep up with the capacity or both. So we're always considering those different things. And in the body, we work to use these detoxification protocols to help the dishwasher catch up. It's such a great analogy. And I would throw in there too for people that not everyone's dishwasher is the same size to start with. Oh, that's such a good point, Megan. Um, And, you know, to, to, uh, to bring that point further, we, uh, Jeffrey Bland actually mentions in his book, Disease Delusion, that our liver detoxification pathways can differentiate by, be different by a thousand times from person to person, right? So I think people have heard that situation where, you know, someone smokes three packs of cigarettes a day and lives to like 100, and then another person smokes three packs a day and dies at like 30 from lung cancer, right? They're exposed to the same toxin but they have a different capacity to actually detox those, um, those toxicants. Um, another example, there was, um, there was a chemical plant in Turin, Italy, and, they, there, and there was an exposure to this chemical, and all the workers in the chemical plant got exposed. And this particular chemical caused bladder cancer. Now, some of them in the plant got bladder cancer, and some of them didn't. So they did a case study on this to see why that was the case. And what they discovered was the people who did not get bladder cancer had an increased ability to detox that specific toxin. It was a pathway in the liver called acetylation. So all exposed to the same thing, but some got the cancer and some didn't. And that really points to the fact that we all have different capacity to to move these toxins through. Right. And in my practice, I call these, um, when we address that, we call them hedge your bets protocols. And, and this is where people are like, well, why really should I eat all these greens if, you know, my neighbor got cancer and they eat this way and exercise, what's the point? Um, and it's exactly Mm -hmm. that, right? We're all different. And there's certain activities that if one wanted to be, uh, diligent, even minorly that you can do on a daily basis to sort of hedge your bets. So you know, that begs the question then, should we all be doing, should we all be detoxing independent of what the body does on its own? Should we actively go in and create a targeted detox on an annual or semi-annual basis? The answer is yes. (laughs) So I I always say, um, if you're not detoxing, you're retoxing. So I like what you always say. That's great. (laughs) 
So we need some sort of daily detoxification plan is what I call it, right? So we need to be doing something on a regular basis to clean it through. It's not about living a very toxic, you know, life most of the year and then doing a detox and cleaning up shop, you know, I can't smoke those cigarettes every day and then say, oh, once a year, I'm going <laughs> to clean out my lungs. Right. It, it doesn't really work that way. So we need habits daily um, for detoxification. And I also recommend that people do a planned therapeutic detox protocol one to two times a year. And I like Doing them in the changing of the seasons is a, is a nice time to do them. So in the spring and in the fall is a good time if you're doing it twice a year. Yeah, I love this concept of daily detox because that's it's just not how health works, right? You don't run until your cup is overflowing and you're symptomatic and you need a, a ton of medication and then you get off the medication and then you run and you get on it again when you get sick. Well, I should say that's not how it works, but that's sort of how the system has trained us to work. So if we're going to move beyond that, if we're going to say, listen, when I know better, I, I do better. How can I be proactive about my health? Take us through what some of the things would look like on a daily basis if we were going to support detoxification actively. Absolutely. So just just to give a sort of a preempt to that and a framework for what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at different daily detoxification items is trying to open what I call the five channels of elimination. So there's five ways that things can move from the inside of the body to the outside of the body. And I call those the channels of elimination. Um, so one is the bowel. Um, you know, you want to be pooping every day, at least once. Um, another is the kidneys. So drinking lots of good, clean water every day to keep those flushed out. Um, and peeing, of course, is, is a way we get rid of that. Uh, the lungs. So doing deep breathing exercises, exercise, you know, just straight up, uh, different pranayama types of breathing, uh, like we learn in yoga, uh, is a great way to get those toxins out of the lungs. Um, then we have the skin. So our skin, you know, gets rid of about two pounds of toxins per day. So we're constantly sweating, even though we don't feel like it sometimes. And we want to help that out. We can do that by skin brushing. We can do that by going into hot saunas, infrared, or just uh, regular saunas. And finally, the one that most people maybe don't even know about or think about or appreciate as an important channel of elimination is the mind. So... I think most people have had the experience where they get something off their shoulders. They use that phrase, you know, I spoke to a friend or, you know, and, and I was able to, I, I got it off my shoulders. It was like on my mind for so long. And that's a way of moving emotions through the body and talking about it is one way, but of course there's lots of other ways to do that. Um, and we, we understand that talk, uh, sorry, emotions can actually become toxic. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Candace Pert. Totally uh, molecules of um, yeah, molecules of emotion, right? Like so, every thought we have, every um, wh whenever we're processing the world around us, that creates a cocktail of chemicals in our body that can either promote growth and healing or cause degradation and ill health. Right. So <laughs> when I put my clients on detox protocols. We also do a mental detox where, you know, we're not reading, you know, trashy magazine, magazines, we're not watching TV, not, look, not reading the news, um, and, you know, just trying to keep the mind pretty clean too. But I, I guess going back to your question, you know, in terms of daily detox, I would say one of the most important things, and it's, you know, it's not that sexy, is just drinking good, clean water. You know, we're mostly water. We're 70 to 80% water. Um, we need to have clean water because it's part of every chemical reaction in the body. It flushes out the kidneys. It flushes out the bowels. It's important for the skin. Um, so, yeah, that's one of my top recommendations. It's amazing. And, and I find, too, water flushes out emotions. And if we're looking at, like, right, if we're looking at, at energetics, and different energetic interventions, um, so many of them, water is a foundation of that of that piece. And so I have a lot of people stand in the shower, and I'm not trying to hijack your podcast here, but they'll they'll stand <laughs> they'll stand in the shower, and I'm like, I want you to just visualize that thing that you need to get rid of, and I want you to consciously put it in the water, and then I want you to drink water, like the capacity of water to deliver 
uh, mechanisms of healing, I think, are incredibly profound. I'm oh, just, my God, absolutely. I'm, I'm just throwing that yeah. out there. Um, I, okay, so we have these things that people can do on a daily basis, and I obviously agree with you. Water is this massively overlooked uh, element. Everyone kind of looks at you like, seriously, don't you have something better than that that you can throw at me? Um, <laughs> but if you're not if you're not doing it, then you, you don't get to go. You don't get to go to the next level. And if if we were to look at the next level as let's say an individualized uh, detoxification process for someone, what does that process look like for you? How do you implement that in your clinical practice? Practice. Right. So we always do uh, a thorough intake for our clients to actually see where those toxins might be lurking. One, sort of the last section of our intake is an environmental assessment. So we ask people about their shampoo, about their soaps, you know, what are they cleaning their home with? What are they putting on their body? You know, do they have any uh, fillings in their mouth? What are their past uh, jobs that they've had? Have they ever been exposed to toxins? Where do they keep their cell phone? Um, You know, do they open their windows in their home? Do they have any plants? I mean, these are all different things to consider. And then I'll create a list based on their answers to kind of personalize it to them in terms of lifestyle interventions. And then um, looking at symptomatology, so the, the messages that the body gives us, I might cater specific um, supplements or foods to that person based on on the information that I gather. So, you know, for example, if they were a past smoker, which is an example we used, we know that uh, smoking and any exposure to inhalants can greatly use up vitamin C in the lungs. Um, So we might be using higher doses of vitamin C to support them. Uh, We might be using some herbs to help cleanse the lungs Um, and foods like, you know, parsley and cilantro is great for the lungs. Um, uh, You know, lobelia and mullein are great herbs for the lungs as well. So we might target the lungs there. Uh, If someone, um, you know, was exposed to just a lot of toxins in their environment, we might put a little bit more focus on the liver, which, you know, has 500 jobs, one of them being detoxification. So we could use certain nutrients to help with liver detoxification. And there's many different um, nutrients that help. Uh, you know, that one example is N-acetylcysteine, which can upregulate glutathione, one of the key antioxidants in the body. Um, and it's also part of conjugation in phase two liver detoxification. We can use antioxidants like milk thistle. We can use herbs that kind of help to purge the liver and clean it out like dandelion and artichoke roots. Um, And then just making sure they're getting a ton of phytonutrients in their food, right? So all these different colors are going to support different pathways in the liver. And we we use a phytonutrient chart that we give to our clients to make sure that they're getting all the colors of the rainbow because each one's going to offer a different uh, special profile of nutrients. What's so interesting is that, you know, over the course of the last few weeks, I've done a a variety of different interviews with with people, and it doesn't matter what topic we're we're speaking about. It always comes down to, and inevitably in every interview, someone will say, you've got to eat all the colors of the rainbow. You've got to eat real food. It's, it's, It's incredible when we're looking at health. It doesn't matter what the downstream manifestation is. It comes back to some of these really strong fundamentals to to eat real food to have water to move your body to be grateful like these these things are not not to be overlooked i totally agree and you know (laughs) it's funny because like there's so many summits out there there's so many podcasts only some of them are really awesome like yours um there's so many you know workshops and and books and studies and you can learn all the biochemical pathways, but exactly as you said, you have to know the fundamentals. Um, and no matter what someone's dealing with, no matter how complex it is, you got to help them to understand they need to drink water and get good sleep and have good relationships and move the body, right? So, yeah, it's so important and we can't overlook those fundamentals. And those fundamentals, no matter how much we know in the scientific world, will always be there. 
Yeah, it's true. I was at a, a documentary screening last night and, and it was all about uh, how to save the hives. I'm completely digressing, but we're going to do it anyway. And, <laughs> um, and, in the, and in this film, the one of the farmers that they interviewed was talking about how he had recently read a paper and the paper was written in 1901. And the principles of farming that this, this farmer was, was discussing was he was saying, you know, we're moving to this, this agricultural model where we're tilling the fields all the time and we're not letting animals walk on the field and we're avoiding crop rotation and and that has implications on the the bacterial diversity in the soil and the quality of food and this one farmer was just remarking in this documentary he was like it's always the fundamentals like this this guy of our 100 years ago before we had all this research was just dialed in to the common sense and the observational approach to science and agriculture um, that I think is 100% applicable to how we approach health in today's day and age. We're constantly looking for what's the magic bullet? What's the secret? What's the, what's the, what's the thing, the latest and greatest that no one has, has heard about? Um, and to that end, I think, I think we've got some, we've got some detox trends that are really common in the marketplace right now. And, and I'm going to go through a few of them and I want to get your take on them. The first one being activated charcoal. Everywhere I go, people are like, check out my black ice cream and my black juice and my black this. I've got activated charcoal. I'm fully detoxing all the time. Um, I've got feelings on this. I'm kind of curious what yours are. <clears throat> well, I have to say that the black charcoal flavor of ice cream is probably the best for detoxification and the ice cream flavors. <laughs> Would you agree? <laughs> you haven't had much it better yet. Than, much, much better than my old time favorite mint chocolate chip. Yeah, okay, that um, was my favorite too, so now I'm compelled to try. Okay, good call. <laughs> no, um, I think it's more of like an Instagram, Pinterest aesthetic thing that you can like make all these things black. Right. Um, but if we look at what activated charcoal actually is and what it's been used for traditionally is... It's fantastic at binding things. So it uses a process called adsorption, which, you know, is an electrical uh, conductivity process or, or attraction process where, you know, it, it's very porous and it just attracts everything to it. So they've used these uh, for poisonings in hospitals. I believe they still do. Yeah, um, I rep. Yeah, I recommend it often to people going traveling uh, where they might eat something bad or, you know, drink something bad to take it as an emergency precaution. And I just tell them, you know, take two capsules every half hour if they think they've eaten something bad or they start to feel ill or get diarrhea or vomit or things like that. So um, I use it more as an emergency thing. Very rarely have I used it as part of a detoxification protocol because if I'm giving it to them and it soaks up everything, it's going to also soak up the good stuff. Um, so I have used it uh, a number of times with people with severe uh, mold toxicity because we actually do want to soak up pretty much everything that's being dumped in the gut, but we don't do it with food. We do it by itself after we've kind of purged the liver and got the gallbladder uh, working as well. So I think it's more of like the aesthetic thing right now um, rather than a product that's using, being used appropriately functionally. Right. And, I, you know, I've had a few people that are like, oh, I take it every day to absorb what's happening in my environment. And I, I'm looking at them. And I'm like, you're also absorbing all of the nutrients and you're, you're not, they're not having the chance to, to enter into your enter into your system. So uh, charcoal will put in the uh, in the time and place category, um, but not a good mm -hmm. not a good long term uh, solution for exposure. What about juice cleanses? So I'll often have people come in and go, oh, I, want, I, I think I'm ready for a juice cleanse. And I look at them, I'm like, you probably aren't. Um, but what's, what's, <laughs> what's your take? Oh, great question. Um, well, juice cleanses, you know, they, they, a short-term juice cleanse, like I'm talking about three days, is probably okay. But one critical thing that the liver needs for proper detoxification are amino acids. And amino acids come from proteins, and a juice fast is very low in protein. Your liver uses these amino acids to what's called conjugate certain toxins, um, which basically means if there's a toxin, we put handcuffs on it so it can be escorted out of the body. Otherwise, it kind of runs free like like a villain without a, without handcuffs. So, if someone's starting to 
get into a juice fast or a juice cleanse and they're releasing toxins and maybe losing um, some fat or breaking down fat, which does hold a lot of toxins, those toxins can go systemic um, if they're not properly conjugating them, processing them in the liver properly. So I usually do recommend that, that people who do want to partake in a juice cleanse do at least one protein shake a day. Uh, and then, you, you know, there's, there's juice cleanses that are sometimes called juice feasts where people go, you know, longer than three, five days, sometimes 15, 30 days. There's, you know, some documentaries out there where miraculous healings have occurred from long-term juice fasting. And I don't doubt it, but it's probably due to the elimination of all the other crap in their diet that's causing such a fantastic healing uh, reaction. Right. And I might have a, a like a complete epiphany if I went down to a jungle lodge and drank juice for a month, too. Like, there's so <laughs> many other factors, right, that... Uh, that that play into it. Really great advice. Um, my last one that I want to talk to you about, and if you have others, I want you to throw them on the table. But and this is a good segue from your last point is the concept of fasting and its role in detoxification. And there's really compelling literature right now looking at the capacity to increase stem cell growth in the face of fasting. Um, but maybe just put some context on that because just to stop eating or to have one of those days where you're like, I've been so busy, I haven't eaten yet. That's not strategic fasting. What is the role of, of fasting as it pertains to detoxification? Right. Well, fasting is, is intriguing me as well as of late. Uh, there's so much great information coming out. And I think, you know, fasting something that's been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And most cultures have some sort of fasting practice as part of it. Um, you know, there's Ramadan where, you know, they fast during the day. Um, you know, Jewish, my religion is, is Judaism. And we, we would have a couple days a year where we fast the whole day. And I think most, most religions actually have some, something like that as, as a form of cleansing, which is interesting. But because of the toxic load that people are under in the past, mostly in the past hundred years, um, fasting, can cause too quick of a release of a lot of those toxins from the body as your body starts to metabolize its own fat to use that for energy and release these things. So there's, you know, fasting is a term that refers to many different types of fasting. Um, we can do different types of intermittent fasting. We can do water fasting. We can do juice fasting, as we just spoke about. We can do elimination diets, which I guess are not fasting. We can try to get the body into ketosis um, using uh, nutritional products or just by fasting. So there's different ways to look at it. And, and again, I think it would be used differently in different contexts, but that most people, you know, don't want to do it completely unsupervised. Yeah, I 100% agree. And, and I find too, a lot of people, you have to be ready for it. So if you have an exposure history um, that maybe you didn't even identify as being problematic, suddenly going on a fast um, can make people feel really unwell really quickly. You don't want to do really bad things quickly, obviously, but you also don't want to do good things quickly. Like, you know, if someone is a drug addict or addicted to sugar or a smoker, if you take that away cold turkey right away, they usually have withdrawal symptoms. So, we, we, you know, we need to proceed with caution, even if we're doing good things. And sometimes it's really important to move slow. Such a great point. Do you have other things that you see in your uh, clinical practice from a detox trend perspective um, that you find problematic or you want to call out or you think require context? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, he's this, got I think to this say. Is, <laughs> this is more of a problem. I think back in the day, it was really popular and I actually had a couple teachers that were promoting it to us. But um, one of the things they recommended were ionic foot baths. And I just have not seen the literature on this. In fact, I saw a study come out, come out saying that it was complete BS, um, where you stick your foot in like this bath and like, I don't know, these chemical reactions happen and the water turns black. So you think you're detoxifying. But that is not a proper way to detoxify. Good call. Um, yeah, in terms of other trends, I think we covered them. Um, but looking on the flip side, too, I, I think one of the best detox uh, things that people can do, which is underestimated, is infrared saunas or just hot saunas. Uh, you know, in a lot of countries, more in like uh, Europe, 
um, it's like a part of the culture and, and people are getting into the sauna like three, four times a week. You know, here in, in Canada, not only are we indoors with clothes on most of the year, but we're barely sweating. So, you know, our sweat is such a great way to get toxins out of the body. Um, and, and that sauna could be a fantastic way to keep, you know, those things moving out of the body on a regular basis. In fact, sweating is one of the best ways to get cadmium out of the body. High levels of cadmium are released in the sweat. Um, so, yeah, actually, uh, my wife and I purchased a sauna, uh, an infrared sauna, about four years ago now when we lived in a pretty small apartment we stuck it in the corner of the room. It came in six pieces. We assembled it in 20 minutes and we were in there, you know, like every week, uh, multiple times a week. So I think that's, that's something that's super helpful that more people should be doing. Yeah, it's such a good point. I'm desperately trying to find space in our, in our Renault home to, uh, to include a sauna. It's, it's such a, it's a, such a great, uh, great tool. You know, we're, we're at a point, uh, we're, we're both in Toronto and, uh, we've had a very lengthy, uh, fall this time of year. Um, is there, is there a good time of year to run a detox? Is this the time of year to do it? Is new year's the time I do it? Does it really matter? Yeah. So I like to do it in the spring and in the fall. Um, New Year's is a nice time because it's the start of something new. People are into New Year's resolutions. I mean, if that's what's going to take for you to get to do a detox, that's a nice time to do it. I'm I'm actually currently doing a detox. We're me and my wife. Um, well, well, Megan mostly launched um, a seven day no sugar uh, challenge, and we have about 900 people joining us for it. It's just amazing. So we're, we're doing it along with everyone and we also kind of take it to the next level and eliminate a whole bunch of other stuff. And I add, you know, some herbs in and whatnot to help with the detox uh, process. So yeah, I think the fall is great. I think the, um, the spring is great. And whenever you can do it, I think is also great. So, uh, yeah. I love the work that you are doing in the world. Josh, what do you want your legacy to be? My legacy. That's a big question. I know. We're um, segueing from saunas to legacy. Keep you on your toes. You know, it's <laughs> it's so interesting. Uh, you know, I've been in this field for about 10 years. And you don't ever, I think, fully understand what the ripple effect of what you do is when you're doing good in the world. Um, I, you know, if I help one person, um, I'm happy. Uh, and then if they go and help another person, I'm even happier. And if I hear about it, I'm really happy. So I think my legacy, you know, I just want to help people um, get healthier so they can live the life they want to live and live their life to their full potential. And if I can do that, um, I'm, I'm a happy man. It's a great answer. And on that, on that notion, how would you define health? Oh, that's a great one too. And it's a question that I ask people applying to work with me as well. Well, that's great. So yeah, I explain what health is to every single client and in every single class that I give because everyone's trying to seek this thing called health, but we don't have a definition for it. And if we want to get from A to B, you know, if you're going to look up a place in Google Maps, uh, you got to tell Google Maps where you are and you got to tell Google Maps where you want to be. And and then it'll show you the route. Most people have uh, don't really have a working definition of health. So in my practice, I use something called the slope of health. Um, and not to you know go into it in too much detail, it basically shows that health is a continuum. You're either going up the slope of health or down the slope of health. You're never stagnant. Just like nature, you know, you go into a forest, everything's either growing or dying. There's nothing that's the same in, in the forest when you go back to that trail. Uh, human bodies are the same way. So if you're not doing things to move towards health, you're moving things, um, you're doing things to move away from health. And that, you know, I've got these different like rungs on my, uh, on my slope, which include, you know, nutrient, vitamin and nutrient deficiencies, poor diet and lifestyle, environmental toxins, internal toxicity. And that's sort of how we slip down the, the slope of health. But uh, if we're moving in the right direction, we're constantly moving towards health. And it's, really a practice that has to occur day in and day out rather than just something we do once. 
Such a great perspective. I I love I love health analogies. I feel like we could we could geek out on our our respective health analogies all day long. <laughs> I'm all about the health analogies because I'm a visual learner. Like, yeah, me too. I, I I yeah I need something to put into perspective, and that's also how I teach my clients and my students. So I'm always looking for easy ways to to explain and understand things. So yeah, I, I'd love to hear some of yours too. Each month, I'm featuring a new anthropology quiz to help you unlock and uncover some of the physical performance blocks that may be holding you back from your true potential. When you know better, you can do better. To learn more or to take the quiz, head on over to meganwalker.com forward slash anthropology quiz. I want to get your take on a few things. So in the in the last little bit of our of our interview, I I like to ask something that I call KPIs or key performance indicators. So just like we have them in our business, I believe that we also have them with respect to our actions as it pertains to our health. So I've got six rapid fire questions for you um, for us to get a little bit of insight in terms of, uh, of what you're doing in your world. Are you ready? Sure. Hit me. Okay. Do you have a consistent morning routine? And if so, can you share? Absolutely. And percent. So um, it sort of has changed since I've had a child. Um, As it does. Up. Yeah. Do you want to hear post-child or pre-child? Let's do post-child because now we're getting real. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I wake up. I uh, His name's Finley. So I take Finley, um, you know, I, I wake up with him. I usually have some sort of drink, uh, whether sometimes it's just straight up filtered water. Sometimes it's got greens in it. Sometimes it's lemon juice um, with water, you know, something to kind of cleanse my system. Um, Then we go for a walk um, out in the park. We live uh, near a beautiful park called High Park. We get some good nature there. Uh, Then I come home. I have breakfast or put him down for a nap. Um, While he's down for a nap, I I might meditate or journal. Um, Then he wakes up from his nap and I play with him a little bit more. Um, I get ready for work. I have the luxury of being able to bike to work most days. And I love that because it gets, you know, the blood flowing. And I, um, I bike to work, I get to work. Um, and then I, I start my day. Yeah. And I used to, I guess, pre, pre Finley, um, I had more time in the morning to actually go to the gym. And that's one of the biggest things that's changed. So I try to do an activity with him, like walking to kill two birds with one stone. That's great. That's what you have to do is functional movement. Fiction, mm-hmm. fiction or nonfiction, what are you reading right now? I'm reading nonfiction. Um, I'm reading uh, two books. One is a, a book on mushrooms that just came out from Four Sigmatic, uh, yeah, my friend I'm Hero too. over there. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. So um, I have I've a bit of a nonfiction problem. Um, my wife, Megan, always says, you know, you got to read some fiction. And I usually pump out a couple of fiction books during the summer. Uh, but mostly I'm, I'm reading nonfiction. What is the one thing you are most consistent with, with respect to your health? There's so, there's so many. I mean, <laughs> the one thing I'm the most... The one consistent. thing, Josh. I'm just The teasing. one most important thing. I guess the morning routine as a whole, because that gets me in this state for the whole day. And it just, it just sets it up. So as a package, if I could choose the one thing as that package in the morning, mornings are so important and sacred to me. That's a great answer. You got to encompass a lot of things there. So that was a, that was a sneaky move. I liked it. <laughs> what is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? I did say I was a diehard skier. So many years ago, I did win a mogul skiing competition. Oh, um, that's so good. that's pretty badass. Yeah. yeah. I like... I like, I, I've always been an adrenaline junkie and I've particularly been um, into getting into the air for as long as possible. So I um, would do a lot of, you know, um, spend a lot of time in the terrain park and something has happened to my brain over the years where I desire to spend a little bit less time in there as, as time goes on. So that would be my badass thing. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens now that you're a father when you when you're on the brink of the terrain park this winter. We'll see. We'll see if that's changed even further. What do you do for fun or play? Um, well, I play with Finley, which is awesome. It's like a whole new perspective on play. All of a sudden, you know, all the songs that you forgot for 20 years are coming back to you. 
Um, but for fun, um, I, I like to play music. I, I also am a drummer, but the drums don't really fit in my house at the moment. So I've resorted to a much smaller instrument, the ukulele. And that kills, kills a lot of birds with one stone as well. Because I get to play thinly. It's fun. I get you know, to release some of my musical energy. And um, that's been bringing me a lot of joy. And it's super easy to travel with as well. That's great. Last question for you. Entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? You know, uh, I don't know. Because I, I feel like I was always wanting to be an entrepreneur. So that's the perspective I've come from. I knew I could never work for someone or like ultimately I would only want to work for myself. Um, but I believe that there's some people that are extremely happy and content working, you know, for someone else. Um, and I, I think that's great too. So, so perhaps it's not something we're born into. It's, it's, it's something that we, we sort of choose um, and that resonates with us mostly. But I be also believe that we can flip flop, you know, and an entrepreneur can go work for someone and be totally content and someone who, you know, works for someone can go and start their own thing too and be perfectly content. Yeah, a, an absolutely great answer. Josh, I know that people are going to want to uh, follow up with you, both on the practitioner and the consumer side. Can you share a little bit about where people can find you? Because I know you're teaching some really fabulous courses uh, for practitioners, but I also know that people who are looking to take their health to the next level are, are definitely going to want to check out your work. Yeah, for sure. So you can find everything I do at Josh gitalis.com g-i-t-a-l-i-s and i'm sure you'll post the link for that i will um you can find information about my consulting on my website and there's also a tab for my certification i provide or teach a functional nutrition certification program um and i offer a variety of courses one of them pertaining to our discussion today is on detoxification we usually start that in january perfect time for the new year's resolution and also a little a little side note if people want to check out some of my ukulele action, um, they can join. They can join me on Instagram, and there's a few videos there. If you search pretty good, where I'm rocking out on the ukulele. I love it. Multifaceted, Josh. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to uh, to have you. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always fun. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world. 